Good evening. Um, I'd like to ask you about your quote about 75% of uh, laws being made by European Union. It's a bit low, but... but uh, apparently that's, that's a missing quote. Um, it's uh, that they have a say in 75% and only regulation that accounts for the European Union. So only 10.4% of laws here have that sort of thing. So... You're the Labour Party member too, aren't you? <laughs> you must be a Labour Party member too, because they tried that in 2008, and they very quickly gave up on it. And even Gordon Brown admitted it was more than 50. So, um, in actual fact, so my question is, what is the problem with pooling sovereignty, not surrendering it? And you should um, make sure that certain things, because human rights are universal, that we, that we share such ideas and what we do. Well, first things first, your figures are below me. Um, as I say, this was an attempt, this was an attempt by the sort of international socialist part of the left who want the United States. In fact, some of them, those who want the United States of Europe, they want one world government. That's the way some of these people actually are crackers, so that's what they think. Um, <laughs> the 75% figure is up for challenge, and I accept that. I do accept that, because in Germany, uh, Roman Herzog, the former president of Germany, conducted a survey of all legislation in Germany between 1998 and 2006, and he found that 84% of German legislation had come from Brussels. I accept 75, we may be too low, I accept that. Um, I'm prepared to concede. No, no, I, you know, you've got to hold your hands up when you're wrong. But I concede we could be wrong. Uh, but we have a completely impotent parliament. Pauline the sovereignty. This is what Michael Hesseltine says. These are the weasel words of those who so loathe and despise this country. They want to get rid of our independence and our freedom and our sovereignty and hand it over to this ghastly bunch of people, and they are ghastly people. I say that not because I disagree with them, but because, you know, just look at how they're acting in Greece and Italy to realise how bad they are. You know, you cannot pull your sovereignty. I mean, it's a bit like virginity sovereignty. You know, either you've got it or you haven't. And, and I don't think there's, I don't think there's a sort of halfway house with this. Um, so the idea, and, and you also said, you also said, legislation over which we have a say. Yeah, we have a say, all right. We have a say, all right. 8%. We have an 8% say in the European Parliament and ultimately in the European Council over whether something becomes a law or not. I am not really interested in us having an 8% say over the future of this country. I want us to have a 100% say, and I'm going to go on fighting for that. Mr. Parch, can you tell me please uh, about the, do you think that America hijacked uh, your uh, foreign policy is using against Iran and against Russia? I think that America is abusing uh, your democracy because European leaders are not listening to European people. They're just only listening to only one man, to the American president or to the Israel. That's a tough question because I'm not sure myself. Historically, European Union foreign policy, or the foreign policy of many of its states, particularly the French, has tended to be the opposite to America. You know, deliberately. And it's as if the EU has been set up as a counterbalance to America. And, and the, the hatred of America that I hear in the European Parliament is remarkable. I rather like America, but I don't like American foreign policy. And I've, I've been opposed to the Afghanistan war, I've been opposed to the Iraq war, and just, just thinking, you know, wasn't Harold Wilson sensible? When Lyndon Johnson came to Downing Street in 1966 and said, we want British troops to come and help us in Vietnam, you owe us, we have a special relationship, you know, Wilson replied by saying, special relationships mean you can say no as well as saying yes. So it's a damn good thing we didn't send British troops to Vietnam, and we shouldn't have got involved in those two engagements. What you've seen on Iran, what you've seen on Iran over the last couple of months, are America and the EU acting similarly, because actually there is a genuine fear. You know, the EU have a, there is a genuine fear in Brussels about Iran's nuclear program. Uh, and there's no getting away from that. Um, and am I concerned about it? Yes. 
I'm concerned about it. Are sanctions the right answer? No. Completely the wrong answer. And I'll tell you why. <coughs> With sanctions, you stop foreign cars coming into the country. You stop all sorts of foreign goods coming into the country. And so what happens is the state control, the state-owned motor car company, now has a monopoly on selling cars in Iran. Ironically, financially, sanctions are the best thing that's ever happened to Ahmadinejad and his friends. And the way I think we should be approaching Iran is completely the other way round. We should be attempting to have as free a possible trade and, and to encourage the growth of the internet and computers right across Iran and then people will see this regime they've got is backward, is taking them for a ride and they'll be more inclined to having different values. Uh, quite honestly, it's such a complex area, it deserves an evening's debate and I hope that's a reasonable answer for that. Right, we're going to do a few more. Not too many more, but we're going to do a few more. Okay? It's been a long week, it really has. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Thomas. Um, the ramifications of leaving the EU will be huge. And uh, the only way you're going to do it is if you get with the election, because the Red, Yellow and Blue uh, Club will just not allow you to do it. Because they're all living together. So how are, you, how are you actually going to do it? How are you going to set up border controls? How are you going to monitor the 5,000 vehicles bringing loads into this country a day that comes through Dover alone? How are you going to control the border? I think it's more than 5,000 actually. It's more than 10. 5%. Yeah, it's going to say, yeah, yeah it's certainly upwards of 5. The, the ramifications of leaving the EU, uh, in terms of our relationship with other European countries, are actually remarkably small. Remarkably small, because if you're doing business with an Italian company, you just go on doing business with an Italian company. If you're going on holiday to Greece, well, if they leave the Euro, it'd be really cheap, won't it? But you know, um, you know, you will go on your family holiday to Greece. So the ramifications of our relationship with the EU are remarkably small. The potential ramifications for how we run this country, I would agree with you, are enormous. And that, I think, is the exciting thing. Because it gives us an opportunity to get our fishing waters back. Just the first day, we say, we're taking back our fishing waters, we're abolishing discards of over-quoted fish. So the potential we would have to get things right, the potential we would have uh, to, to, to adopt in trade terms a more global approach than European approach, I find very exciting. Look, you're quite right when you say that the red, the yellow, and the blue are utterly committed to, keep it, to keeping us in the EU and utterly committed to not giving us a referendum. You are quite right about that, which is why I said the pressure groups actually aren't the answer. I, look, albeit under a PR system, but I do think the fact that UKIP managed to come second across the entire country in 2009 was an extraordinary thing. I felt dreadful the next day, but there we are. Um, <laughs> head of the party. Um, the fact that in the opinion polls last year, despite the massive inbuilt disadvantage to UKIP of the first past the post, I mean, you know, we are the one party that suffers more than anybody with the first past the post system, because our support is spread across England, particularly, in a very linear fashion. But, you know, coming up to Christmas, there we were, level pegging, and in one opinion poll, ahead of the Lib Dems. And this is partly a reflection, of course, of the fact that the Lib Dems were the student, uh, uh, yeah, student age bracket, they're not as popular as they were. Um, so we're on the up. We're on the up. And if we get into this position, as I say, where in a county like Kent, with the exception of Tunbridge Wells, the Tory party cannot win a single seat because UKIP has become so big and strong by the time 2015 comes along, I promise you there will be a referendum. I do know Cameron a little bit. Um, I don't dislike him as a man, um, there are some people I do dislike, I say so, but I don't dislike him as a man, um, but I'm convinced of one thing, his real motivation is to have the keys of the door to number 10 Downing Street after the 2015 election. That matters far more to him than any political ideology, um, and if we're the barrier between him and the keys to the door of number 10, then we will get our referendum. And as I repeat, if the British people completely disagree 
with the view that I've got, and Kate who has got, and, 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 and uh, Bill Cash has got, if they disagree completely and want us to say part of this thing, I will respect that. I won't like it, but I'll respect that. But the reason I'm here, and the reason I've given up a well-paid job to do this, is because we've been told a pack of deliberate lies by these people for decade after decade. Oh, it's just a common market. Nothing to worry about. And the day the European Constitution was launched, back in 2003, Giscard d'Estaing stood there and said, with this document, we become a global superpower. And Peter Hain, who was the Europe Minister, was in the House of Commons saying, it's just a mere tidying up exercise. It's a classic example of the extent to which career politicians in Britain have denied us the truth of it on this issue, and that's why I'm here. I'm not against anybody in Europe, I'm not against European nations, but I'm very angry with our career politicians in Britain for giving away what I see as our best right. Right, just one more question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is it not true that the problems in Greece stem from a national and a global recession, not just the euro, and if it wasn't for the European Union and the money given by the European Central Bank, which wouldn't have been given, we, we, we wouldn't go and buy a load of unstable bonds in Greece and in Italy if, if we were on our own. We wouldn't have done that. The money that was there um, in the financial safety net from the European Central Bank has enabled Greece to stay afloat and to have the working class people not be completely destitute. And if, right. their com if, if the country had gone bankrupt, then we would have a knock-on effect because we would lose trade with Italy and Greece. If it, if it wasn't for the ECB and the IMF, then how would Greece have been, been able to stay afloat at all? The money that has come from the European institutions and the IMF, yeah, that money that has gone to the Greek government has been used to pay off banks that made very imprudent loans in the first place. It is almost like an unholy alliance between Goldman Sachs and the European Commission. That money is a, that, excuse me, that money is not benefiting Greek people at all. And the problem these Mediterranean countries have had is this. If you, economists here, if you look at long-term interest rates, you will see Deutsche Bank interest rates roughly doing this. You will see if you put together Greek, Portuguese, Spanish, and Italian interest rates into one line, you'll see a gap like this. But all the way through the 80s and 90s, there was a massive differential between interest rates in Germany and, and, and what we call the Club Med. Huge divergence of rates. They joined the Euro, and suddenly it was all one interest rate. And what it meant, by the way, Ireland, should be included in this too. What it meant is suddenly there was free money. Because interest rates overnight, in Spain for example, had halved. And at the time the banks had all gone completely bloody mad and were bending over to lend, 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 lend. And Greece went on a seven year party. The biggest booze up in history. Where the glass was constantly being filled up. And they said, way, this is absolutely marvellous. We can bring the retirement age down to 55. Uh, we can, uh, in the case of Spain, we can build, let's start massive building developments. And the real tragedy was that they lived through a completely false boom. And it meant that when the bus came, it was far worse than it could have been. And, and what, what the Greeks need now is devaluation. If they kept trapped inside this economic prison of the euro, I mean it, there will be a revolution. Mm. So the euro has been a disaster for, for the Mediterranean. It was a disaster in the good times because it fueled a false boom, and it's now actually facing a catastrophe. Inter uh, sorry, currency rates are a bit like a golf handicap. You know, you can be Tiger Woods. I can be the local club pro, uh, the, the club golfer at Canterbury Hills. And we can go out on a Sunday morning and have a, good, and have a good game of golf because of the handicap system. And if in ten years' time, you know, you're much worse than you were and I'm much better, then that handicap between the two of us would narrow. And that's how foreign exchange rates work. 
They go up or down according to your relative strength or weakness against your trading partners. And every attempt in history to fix exchange rates has ended in a mess and ended in a break. And Greece should have left the euro over a year ago. She's being kept inside by Merkel and others because they want to preserve their European dream.